Hola. Before we get to designing sequential circuits to accomplish tasks for us, we will start by analyzing circuits. This will show us the general structure of how next state logic, state memory, and output logic work together using flip-flops and logic gates. There are two types of sequential circuits, Mealy and Moore. This video will analyze a given Mealy machine. And here it is. It looks a little overwhelming at first. We have an input named X, an output named Z, and many things in between. Understanding the circuit means knowing what states it passes through and what inputs cause those changes. This will be accomplished by looking at the instructions given to each flip-flop. A couple of notes before we dive into that. First, I took advantage of a logic work shortcut, naming wires. Notice how the switch feeds into a wire named X. Down here on this OR gate is another wire named X. Those wires will carry the same signal, just as if I actually drew the line connecting them. As shown, this x up top equals zero, and so this x down below equals zero. This shortcut just makes it easier to read the schematic without so many lines flying around. Also note that there is an extra D flip-flop on the right side of the circuit. This is not actually part of the state memory, but helps mitigate a couple potential problems with this Mealy machine. First, it is strobed. This means that it changes on the opposite clock edge of the other flip-flops, thanks to this knock gate. This provides the logic gates half a clock cycle of time to make sure that the final output is correct. We wouldn't want a machine to spit out a free gumball because an incorrect intermediate signal passes straight to the output. Secondly, it holds the output signal constant for one full clock cycle. This is a Mealy machine, which means the input signal feeds directly to the output logic. You can see that in the bottom right. The output logic is just this AND gate, which has X prime as one of its inputs. If that switch for X were fluctuating rapidly, then this output Z could potentially fluctuate as well. This D flip-flop doesn't alter the logic of the output, it just makes sure it holds steady. The last note regards these asynchronous inputs, set and reset. They are part of the flip-flop device symbol, so I must pass some value into them. And they are important. A JK flip-flop needs a starting value. It can't correctly toggle if it doesn't have a starting value. In typical operation, we might reset the flip-flops at the very beginning, and then never touch the asynchronous inputs after that. Okay, that was a lot of background information, but now let's get to actually analyzing the states. The first step is to identify the Boolean equations for each flip-flop instruction input. In some cases, this is done through logic gates, and we see those at the bottom for K1, J1, and Z. In other cases, the logic is so simple that a gate isn't necessary. Look at this J0 port. I call it J0 because it is the J input to flip-flop 0. Its input signal is X prime, so its Boolean equation is simply J0 equals X prime. Even simpler is K0. Its signal is plus 5 volts, therefore its equation tells us K0 always equals 1. Pause the video and work on the follow along worksheet. Try to write the remaining equations for J1, K1, and the output Z. The equation for J1 is Q0 and X prime, taken straight from this AND gate. The equation for K1 is Q0 or X, taken straight from this OR gate. Finally, the equation for Z is Q1 and Q0 and X prime. Keep those equations handy as we move to the next slide. Now we get to the next state table. This has three broad sections, present state, flip-flop inputs, and next state. Let's start with the present state section. Our circuit has two flip-flops in state memory, which we named flip-flop 1 and flip-flop 0. Each of those has an output, Q1 or Q0, which are listed here. 
we need to know how the circuit responds for each input at each possible state. Therefore, we have a row with state 0, 0 and an input of 0, as well as state 0, 0 with an input of 1. Similarly, there is a row for state 0, 1 with an input of 0, and again with an input of 1. This is repeated for all other possible state codes and input value combinations, giving us 8 rows in total. It was a little cumbersome describing the full state code. Easier is if we give each state a name. Arbitrarily, but sensibly, I chose A, B, C, and D as the state names. Notice there are two rows with state A, because there are two rows with state code 00. That explains where the present state entries come from. Now for the flip-flop input section. This is where the Boolean equations come into play. We simply fill this out like a truth table. For example, we know that the equation for J1 is Q0 and X prime. This produces the column shown here. J1 is high when Q0 is high and X is low. J1 is low for all the other rows. Go ahead and try to complete the rest of these J and K columns on your own. We'll get to the Q plus columns later. Pause the video while you do this. The equation for K1 was Q0 or X, which produces this column. J0 is simply X prime, so this column is always the complement of the X column. And K0 is the simplest of all. It equals 1 all the way down. Now for the next state section. These Q plus values are a little trickier to fill out. To do so, we need to reference the characteristic table for JK flip-flops. Q1 plus means the Q1 output at the following clock pulse. This is determined by the current Q1 value and the J1 and K1 instructions. So I'll start by ignoring these other columns. Now we go row by row. This top row says that J1 equals 0 and K1 equals 0. This is no change mode. Since Q1 starts at 0, it remains at 0. The next row says that J1 equals 0 and K1 equals 1. This is reset mode. So Q1 will become 0. It doesn't even matter what the starting Q1 value was in this case. The next row has both J1 and K1 equal to 1. This is toggle mode. Q1 starts low, so it will toggle high and a 1 is written here. Continuing this pattern allows us to fill in all of the cells in this column. Pause the video and try the Q0 plus column on your own. Here are my results. If you got different numbers, try to figure out why by focusing on just the sub-0 columns and referencing the characteristic table. This Z column could have been done a little earlier. We have a Boolean equation for Z, which is Z equals Q1 and Q0 and X prime. So only this row gives us a one for Z. This final state name column is my favorite part. We simply match the new Q1 and Q0 state codes to the naming convention we established on the left side of the table. So. Wherever I see 0, 0, I fill in A. Wherever I see 0, 1, I fill in B. This happens to be only the top row here. And I continue filling in the remaining rows. Now the table is complete. It takes some time. The hard part is not so much any individual step, that's just filling in zeros or ones based on a Boolean equation or a characteristic table. The hard part is maintaining focus on every single square and not making a mistake. At the end of this table, there are three columns we really care about. Present state name, input, and output state name. These are what will allow us to draw the state diagram. Begin this step by drawing one node for each state name. Notice how in each node I include the state name and the 2-bit code. Then we'll use the table to draw arrows between the nodes. 
If the circuit is at state A and the input is zero, it moves to state B. So we draw an arrow going from A to B with an input zero written next to it. Similarly, if the circuit is at state A and the input is one, it remains at state A. So we draw an arrow looping from A back to itself with a one next to it. Complete the state diagram yourself. Resume the video when you're done. My final state diagram looks like this. As a double check, I note that there were eight rows on the table and there are eight arrows on the diagram. These counts should always match. What is the star doing here? That is what I'm using to indicate the special case where the output is asserted. The table tells us that z equals one only when leaving state d with an input of zero. And that's exactly where the star goes. Now we reflect on this state diagram. What patterns do you notice? Three things jump out to me. Each time the input is one, the circuit returns to state A. Each time the input is zero, the circuit moves on to the next alphabetical state, A to B, B to C, etc. Overall, the circuit appears to be a sequence detector, searching for an input of four consecutive zeros. That is the only case where the output is high. This wraps up our first analysis of a sequential circuit. We'll continue next video with an example of a Moore machine, including seeing the circuit in action in the simulator.